As you heard in the announcements, the stewardship team and a few council members have prepared this worship. With that said, we did not feel comfortable providing a sermon today. Instead, we will be sharing times of generosity. After a few testimonials, we will be asking you to share a time that you have been a witness of generosity. Please rise as you are able to join me in the call to worship. We who are thirsty long for water. I will cause water to spring up. We who are weak long for strength. We who are broken long for restoration. Let us imagine together. God of healing and hope, we hear your challenge to imagine together. But imagining can be a difficult task for those over the age of six. And together is even more challenging. We don't do much together in our society right now. Without imagination, and without togetherness, we are lost and broken. Holy One, we need your radical strength so that miracles may happen in our midst, that people may come together across divides, and that the very earth itself will be whole. Amen. Our opening hymn is Community of Christ in the Black Hymnal, number 314.
Welcome each other. Welcome the stranger. Welcome all who came. As Christ welcomed everyone, no matter what their background, no matter what their social status, as Christ welcomed enemies and friends, outcasts and leaders, foreigners and neighbors, let us open our hearts and greet one another with love and peace. At the beginning of this service, the children were given containers. Inside those containers were random objects that did not necessarily go together. There was no rhyme or reason for why two or more of the objects would be in the same container. I challenged the children to see if they could make something with those objects by putting them all together using only tape, string, and or pipe cleaners, and of course, their imaginations. So at this time, I would like to call the children up to come forward with their containers. It's okay if you're not ready, just show us what you have so far. What did you make? I made, me and Wes made an alien. A popsicle stick, a plastic screw, a nail, and a bolt. What did you make? supposed to make a little cat container because we found a cat stuffed animal downstairs in the play area. So we just wanted to make a little container. What were you going to make before? Right now I'm working on a log cabin and I've made the door frame and the, the door is sort of coming along. <laughs> nice. So to be honest, when I was putting these together, I had not a lot of ideas of what you could have and I felt like my ideas were very simplistic and you guys ran with this, so good job. And it might seem silly, that I asked you to try and make something out of these objects, but I wanted you to use your imaginations. I actually really wanted you to show us adults that an object alone may not seem like much, but when paired with other things, something different, something better can be created. So as you look around the church, every single one of us has a gift, a talent, an ability. If we pair it with others, or with our church, or our community, that gift, that talent, that ability, or yep, that ability can start to do amazing things. Now, we don't have tape, string, or pipe cleaners that we use to hold our church or our community together. So what do you think we could use instead? Community. Besides the building, what else could we use to bring ourselves together? Love. Yeah, that's a great one. Do you have any other ideas? 
Our legs. Our legs, yes, to physically bring us together. God. God, yes. Those are all amazing ideas. So I ask you to take this time as we move into our um, dedication Sunday, which will be in October. I want you to start thinking about how we can use our abilities, our talents, to bring us together. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, it is so easy for us to focus on what is broken, lamenting that it may never be fixed. Forgive us when our laments turn to obsessions that hold us down and make brokenness a self-fulfilling prophecy. Remind us that you are our God who restores. Renew our hearts for imagination again today. Amen. Restoration is part of God's plan for us. God is healing the broken pieces of our lives and communities, causing flowers to spring up in the deserts and making weak hands strong. That gift of incredible power and love is for you. Amen. God, in these troubling times, we thank you for being the refuge that keeps moving us beyond retreat. Let us now take time to silently share our concerns with God. Amen. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the ever. Amen. Please join with me in the prayer of response. We hardly know what to say, so even praying can seem difficult and unfocused at best. But that's okay, because the Spirit can help us and even pray for us when we don't know what to say or even how to feel. The Spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Whatever you do, be sure to hug your loved ones today and let them know that we will all be held securely in God's arms. Let us say together the prayer of illumination. Living God, help us to hear your word that we may truly understand that understanding 
we may believe, and believing, we may follow in your way in all faithfulness, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Amen. The scripture reading today is Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be loved forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of the briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Please join me in the response to the reading. We have listened with imagination. May our minds be renewed. We have listened for wholeness. We have listened in generosity. This is The Gift of Love, an American folk tune by Hal Hobson. And Orion's preparing this piece as part of his audition for the American Guild of Organist Service Player certification in October. Um, but this week we're sharing it with you.
striving so Thank you, that was beautiful. All right, as Liz had mentioned, what we're doing instead of a um, sermon, which was way too daunting, um, we're doing some testimonials about when and how we've re received generosity in our lives. And I'll be the first one to go. And so I, I have to say, when I was first asked to give this short two to four minute testimonial, I was daunted. My mind went blank. In sign language, when things go dim, it's like, and that's what I felt like. Um, I worried I wouldn't be able to eke out anything close to two minutes. So I took a couple of deep breaths, and I set my mind to it. And the first thing to come to my mind is the time and support my parents gave me in a difficult time in my life. So to give you some background, I was in my late 20s. I found myself alone with my five-year-old son, Paul, in North Carolina after a divorce. I had no real resources there, a dead-end job, no college education, or chance to better life for me and Paul. So my parents came, they moved me up to Brimfield, and I stayed, well, we both stayed with them for a few months until I got a job and on my feet enough to get an apartment and start over. And I know that was a real disruption and a drain on their resources. But their generosity didn't stop there. They got, um, I went back to college. I had dropped out in my sophomore year and moved back and moved to North Carolina. So they rearranged their lives again to help me again. So what they would do, they would pick up my son from daycare at least twice a week and care for him, you know, bring him home, feed him supper, entertain him, put him to bed, get him up, get him breakfast, get him back to daycare. And that allowed me to go to night school a couple of nights a week while I worked full time. And this went on what felt like 20 years, but I think it was only five. And they were a really big part of his childhood and they enabled me to get my degree in accounting. So you fast forward a year or two, and a CPA who went to the same church I went to at the time asked me if I wanted to interview for a job at his firm because he'd heard I had just graduated with an accounting degree. So it turns out that was the first step in my becoming Mrs. Ron Christensen. So you just never know how things are going to work out with a little generosity. And I can imagine some of you are thinking, though, but those were your parents. They really had to do that. But they didn't really have to do that. They had raised me up, sent me out in the world, and um, they still took me back. And it was a sacrifice and a disruption to their lives for which I'm very grateful. But that also got me thinking about, well, there's generosity outside the family. So I thought about our church and other churches and all the generosity I witness here. There are so many volunteers giving their time, talents, and money. 
There is the community garden, which takes a lot of time and effort, and there's produce and flowers for people who'd like some or need some. Uh, someone supplies communion supplies every month for our communion. There's a community breakfast, which takes a lot of effort, where we come and we can be in community with each other and support each other. And there are people who help provide meals that we serve to Dismas Farms, and I could go on and on and on. But I thought, okay, well, that's kind of an expected thing, too, because this is a church arena. It's what we do. We cultivate community and support, and I happen to think here we're pretty good at that. So I thought, well, what about the wider world? I've received many small acts of kindness. They're just too many to even remember or mention this at this point. Um, Co-workers would volunteer to babysit for my son on occasion. Um, I'm out walking in the heat and people are asking me if I need help. I get a ride when I don't, you know, when I need one, when my car is a problem. To so something really small, like just a smile from a stranger that didn't have to take the time, that really lifts me up when I needed it. So when I think about generosity, to those we don't know, I think of what Mr. Rogers said. And he always said, look for the helpers you will always find people who are helping. So for me, I intend to look and appreciate the helpers and to be one myself. So I started out this testimonial wondering how in the world I could possibly fill up two minutes talking about generosity, to now to having so many examples that I really can't do them all justice in two minutes. And I feel very, very blessed for all the generosity I've received. Thank you. Ron, your turn. Those of you who may be wondering, I could have gotten here faster, but then I wouldn't fill up the time that I was required to speak, so that's why I took the time. Good morning, all. My wife, Deb, informed me that as co-leader of the worship group after Pastor Don's leaving in April, that I will be offering a testimonial regarding generosity during this morning's worship service. I guess I understood my responsibility and agreed and then found it very difficult to think of a specific example of my being the recipient of actions that qualify. Looking back over my decades of membership in the congregation of three churches in my adult life, I've had multiple opportunities to witness genuine examples of concern, love, and respect being passed amongst the congregants of the churches. A few even directed my way and appreciated by me, but none that would take the requisite time to offer here. Something came, finally came to me, however, so bear with me a bit and imagine the Christensen's family in the 1960s. I was just going into high school at that point. I was able to remember a situation relating to my immediate families showing love towards me. At the time, I appreciated the change in the Christensen's family setup, but just considered as part of family interaction. It was in the early 60s when my parents were informed that I should attend college. Although they understood the opinion offered, it created an unexpected payout of significant funds. At the time, my father was the sole breadwinner of the family, and my mother was the then typical stay-at-home spouse, caring for the home, my sister and me. We were a blue-collar family with no experience of having a household member attending college. Although I was working part-time during the school year and full-time during the summer, I realized that my pay would be needed to, sa to be saved for, the co for my college education, but certainly was not going to be significant enough. To meet the proposed financial obligation, my parents decided 
my mother would find a full-time job. And I'm not sure what, if you can think back in the 60s where it was a one, a single member er, wage earner in the family, for the second one to come into the, that situation was a bit unusual. It certainly is not unusual today. After high school, I was able to attend UMass Amherst and my four years of education were paid for. I never saw a bill for tuition, and no mention was made of what I now realize was a significant, generous indication of their love for me. Now there is one small part, if you think of tuition, and tuition back in the 60s is nowhere close to where the situation of tuition today. But I would also suggest that my, what my father was earning in the 60s is significant less than what a blue-collar worker is working is earning today. I think what came to mind, however, and this is so ridiculous, but I need to mention it, that my knowledge of generosity came about for the four years when I was in college, and I looked forward to a weekly note from my mother, and included in the note was a little $5 bill. And that was what I was to use as my allowance in Amherst for the following week. Now in closing, I'm not sure if my story falls in line with Stewardship Sunday, other than suggesting that we truly love this church as my family loved me. To offer a gift that is not what is left over, but one that is an important part of our personal budget is gonna be important for the life of this church going forward. Thank you for the time. Good morning. Nobody told me that this was supposed to be two minutes. <laughs> I guess, I guess you're, I should say I'm, I'm not a good listener. When I was first asked to speak about generosity, I immediately said yes. I'm 81 this year. I have been the recipient of much generosity over my life. I would like to share a few examples with you. Half a lifetime ago, when I was 40, I was going through a midlife crisis. As a result, I started a daily habit of setting aside the first half hour of every morning to read a one-page faith-based story, keep a journal record of yesterday's significant events that I was thankful for, and ending that with a short prayer. I believe that most acts that we feel thankful for are closely related to generosity. To me, generosity is the human virtue of not only giving, but to give more than is enough. Acts of true generosity involve selflessness, putting the needs of others ahead of your own needs. As I started to make my list, the examples I could think of were so many I couldn't begin to even describe them. But I picked three. First one uh, titled A Mother's Love. The second one, a man named Sidney Bliss, a minister from my childhood. And the third one, a man named Norman Cloutier, lifetime friend of mine of great generosity. <clears throat> my mother's love. My first recollection of my early childhood is my mother's love. What I remember is the comfort and security I felt uh, from my mother as she held me in her lap every night at bedtime, bathed me, told me she loved me, and made me feel special. 
This memory has stuck with me all of my life. However, as Ron mentioned, it really didn't come to me until I was in, in the middle of my life. It didn't happen right away that I recognized the significance of my mother's love. Two things I believe about a mother's love. It is a gift, freely, generously, and unconditionally given by our Lord and Maker to all women who give birth. If used, this gift grows and it spreads to as many aspects of life, to many aspects of life, and is often acquired and passed on by those who receive a mother's love. That's story number one. My second example, I was age seven, living in Chicago with my family, with my folks, when I, a man named Sidney Bliss and his family moved in next door to us. They had two boys about the same age as my brother and I, and along with other neighborhood kids, Reverend Bliss organized a baseball team and arranged baseball games with other groups of kids. He funded these activities out of his own pocket. He spent lots of time with us. His wife gave us Bible study lessons in their home each week. This was the beginning of my increased knowledge of the Bible and the memorization of Scripture. I remember Mrs. Bliss well. She was what I referred to as a Catholic nun on steroids. <laughs> I remember a lot of what she taught me. Reverend Bliss, Bliss seemed like kind of a goofy guy to us kids, especially when he would precede each of our ball games with prayer. <laughs> we kids looked at each other and almost laughed out loud. But Reverend Bliss and his wife were so devout in their faith and gave so generously of their time and their knowledge and their own money, I will never forget the favorable impact their generosity had on the direction of my life. The final example I have is a story about a man that's become a lifelong friend of mine. His name is Nord Norman Cloutier. I was 40 years old. It was springtime when I was given my 20-year service award and my pink slip. I was scared, desperately searching for a job, and had turned to my faith and the power of her prayer as an important part of my job search process. One day I had a man with a meaning named Norman Cloutier who owned a company that had done work for me as part of my job responsibilities. I asked Norman if he could refer me to any of his other clients, and in the course of our conversation, I mentioned to Norman that my real dream job was to own my own business. Right then and there, Norman said to me, why don't you buy my business? At that very meeting, we reached the tentative deal for sale. He told me literally, I will help make this possible for you. At a meeting with Norman's accountant and his lawyer, they told Norman and I, Norman, this is a bad deal for you. It's too generous. My wife and I became the owner of Norman's company. My wife was scared to death and so was I. But it was more than anything I was driven by the thought that failure was not an option and my confidence was greatly bolstered by my faith in the power of prayer. Norman was a self-professed Christian, a man of his word, and he delivered on every promise in his original offer. After the formal closing, my accountant asked me uh, a fact, a question. He said, what factors helped you decide to go ahead with this purchase? Meaning that he didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> anyway, um, he answered his own question. He said, you bought this company based on faith. And I said, you're right. Faith was a big part of the reason that I went ahead with the purchase. That was over 40 years ago. Norman and I are still good friends today in doing things together. Sandy and I sold the business several years ago. We decided to offer the same kind of generous purchase terms and the opportunity that Norman had given us. To this day, Norman is truly a selfless man, a Christian, and continues with a habit of generosity. His generosity in all aspects of his life continues to be a huge influence on the direction and course of my life to this very day.
basically, I'll end it there. <laughs> in, I guess let me, let me finish by just saying in summary, I came to believe that becoming generous is a continuous journey. It's not a destination. It can be a gift of God or from other persons who they themselves have experienced generosity of others. It is a progressively acquired trait and become habit forming. If you are the beneficiary of someone else's generosity, you become awed by it and you feel you want to pay it back or as they say today, pay it forward. And you feel good that you are able to help others. When generosity is practiced, it can become a mindset where you are actively looking for opportunities or ways to help others, to put the needs of others ahead of your own. It can grow within you and becomes part of your internalized process. I feel so fortunate to be a part of this church family and to experience the generosity that comes from so many pe people here. Each of us on our own, in our own ways, each of us on our own generosity journey making this church such a special place and making the world a better place. Does anybody else have any, any thoughts on generosity that they would like to mention? You're welcome to come forward. thank everybody that's been helping me through with Richie. He had a stroke on May 30th. The two gentlemen came to give me an air conditioner. Another lady's been doing a lot of gopher stuff. I have at least two ladies that are doing me gopher stuff. And my friends and I, um, they want him too. And I'm just hoping everybody will give me room to grow. He's home, but he is what he is, and I have to work with it. You know, and neighbors have been, neighbor, the night it happened, I was on prayer group. I went to ask him something, he wasn't answering me. I hung up the phone, went to see him, he flopped over. Thank God the neighbors were at home. I called the gentleman over because I figured he's a burly guy, he can pick him up off the floor and put him on a chair. And no way that was going to happen, we had to call the ambulance. The ambulance took him to the um, helicopter ride. My neighbor and I went to um, Harrington. They, in turn, it, I said, here goes Richie. They were going to UMass, so they stayed me. They've been very good about staying with me and helping me. And it's just, I'm trying to find time to take care of me now a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm working, what I'm trying to do. Well, thank you for sharing. I, too, have found that the church is a very generous place, place and I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. Does anybody else want to offer any, any thoughts? Sure. I'm listening to all this uh, discussion on generosity. I thought back to the invocation, which talked about togetherness. And each and every story involved togetherness. This morning, we are here worshiping together. And in our own way, it took some generosity to get here. Uh, this, this group is a blessing. It's generous. Together, we have painted the church, which was no small feat. Together, we celebrated 300 years, which was no small feat. That's a lot of years. And together, I'm very comfortable that we will get through this transition period and come out better on the other side. There's no doubt about it. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? We'll continue the service. We're going to sing a hymn called As Partners in Christ's Service in the Black Hymnal, page 495. Service, call to ministries of grace. 
if you could imagine something broken being made whole, what would it look like? How would it feel? We are partners with God in working for that restoration and wholeness. As we share our offering and prayers, add your imagination about something restored, a special, a special blessing in the stewardship season. dedication God of repair and restoration we are all so grateful for all the miracles that you have given to our lives our livelihoods and this community of faith we pray that you will use these gifts to continue making our miracles amen our closing hymn is strengthen all the weary hands in the black hymnal number 612.
imagine together a world made whole is the first step. Once we imagine it, we can believe it. Once we believe it, we can work for it. Go now with God's peace, seeking restoration in the world. Amen.